Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the team from Autocon. Uh, we're really excited to have you for this session, um, getting ready to work or getting ready to start work, I think. Um, so thank you very much and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Becca. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, yeah, we're Autocon. Um, I'm Mo and we've got Russell and Sarah from Autocon as well. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I've got a presentation that we're going to talk through about um, getting ready to work. Yeah, so like I said to you, um, there's three of us from Autocon here today. I'm Mo, I'm the marketing manager at Autocon um, and I've been with Autocon about six months. Um, let the others introduce themselves. I go first. Uh, hi everyone. Um, my name is Russ. I've been here slightly longer, uh, just coming up to five years now. So I'm the lead job coach. Uh, so I manage our team of four job coaches um, who are all kind of neurodiversity specialists and provide the emotional and practical support for our consultants. Um, I My background is in clinical psychology, so I work for different autism and learning disability services in Bath and Bristol uh, before coming to, to Autocon. Uh, and I have a background also in mental health services, providing psychological support. And I also work for a period of time in an assessment treatment service, uh, diagnosing autism uh, as well. So Sarah? Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Sarah and I'm a data science consultant at Autocon. Um, and yeah, I've been at Autocon for a, a year, over a year and a half now. Um, and before I joined Autocon, I did completed my PhD at Imperial um, in the numerical modeling of um, fireballs, which is quite cool. Um, but yeah, that's just a bit about my background. Um, yeah. Very cool. It's a very cool thing to have done PhD in. Um, so just a little bit about what we're going to discuss uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction as to who Autocon is, what we do. Um, and then we're going to look at um, how you find an autism friendly employer, what to look for. Um, there's going to be some advice around managing the recruitment process. And we're going to share a couple of um, uh, experiences from some of our other consultants as well. The first one being from Malcolm, who will talk a little bit about the recruitment process. Um, we have scheduled a break for five minutes um, and then when we come back we'll talk about disclosure in the workplace and have another video from another consultant called Emma. At the end there will be an opportunity for some questions and answers but if you think of any questions as you go along do put them in the chat and I can either read them out on your behalf if you'd rather. Um, okay, so it goes to me first with a little bit of an introduction about Autocon, um, which is always a pleasure to talk about because we're a nice company. Um, so we're, not, we're a social enterprise, which basically means that we're not um, driven so much by the profits we make, but rather by our social values. And um, our values are around um, addressing the inequalities that there are in employment for autistic and neurodivergent people. Um, I've put a little bit of a timeline here. I don't know how big that is on your screens, but in, in brief, um, we started in 2011 in Berlin. Um, we were started basically by a dad with an autistic son, and he recognised that uh, his son and many of his son's friends had um, really great uh, abilities, but they were struggling to get employment. And he looked at the figures of employment for autistic people and was really shocked. Uh, he just didn't kind of get that. That didn't make sense to him. So he wanted to do something about it and set up Autocon. Um, in 2016, our office here in the UK in London um, opened and we've since opened an additional office in Edinburgh in 2019. Um, one of our backers, one of our investors is the Virgin Group. Uh, Richard Branson has named us one of the three companies he admires most and as he's quite a advocate of neurodiversity in the workplace that's um, that's great for us and um, like I said we've won quite a few awards um, in the years since we've been here in the UK and um, one we're all very proud about is with the social enterprise of um, uh, social enterprise of the year last year uh, which is great um, and one of the top 10 most loved workplaces, which is also lovely because that's uh, our consultants and our employees telling us that they like working for us. So that's very nice. Um, what I always say about Autocon is that it's a win, win, win model. And what I mean by that is uh, we want to have impact on the individuals that work for us. And that by that, we mean that we kind of want to be able to provide them 
meaningful work um, and the ability to thrive and succeed at the work they do. Um, so we provide high quality IT careers for our autistic consultants. Um, but also we want to have an impact on the organisations we work with, our clients. And that impact is it comes as a result of working with our consultants. When our consultants go into an organisation, obviously they have an impact <clears throat> on the very work that they do, um, which is addressing a big skill shortage in the data science sector. But other than that, um, you know, they are breaking down barriers for, for our clients by, you know, by kind of educating them that working with neurodivergent um, talent is is great and it's possible. And um, the adjustments that they might have been worried about making are not usually that big and they they find it quite quite rewarding experience um and of course by by the very fact that they go through that process and that they you know they are educated in in experiencing that um that has an impact on on broader society you know that they go home and tell their friends about you know how great it is working with neurodivergent people together and of course it improves their confidence to hire more neurodivergent people so um that's that's what we feel so um in terms of impact, of course, so we always want to measure it and be a bit more precise with the impact we're having. So we do an impact report every year, and I thought you might find it interesting to just kind of see where we're at on that from our last year's impact report. Um, the, when we uh, spoke to our consultants, 92% uh, of them said they felt supported at work, 83 said they had an improvement in their well-being, and 79% said they felt more confident, with over 90% saying they felt valued for who they are, which is great. Um, when we spoke to our clients, 85% of them said that they had a greater understanding of neurodiversity when working with Autocon, um, and 93% of said that Autocon consultants made a valuable contribution to the work and the projects that they're doing. Um, so we can really see that that has an impact on, on those clients. Um, and then at a societal level, we're always looking for ways that we can amplify this conversation. What our intention is with our social mission is that we, you know, that we um, empower more organisations to employ neurodivergent um, people. And so we have a podcast series um, that we really are proud of um, called Autocon in, um, Autism in Conversation with Autocon. And we've had lots of interesting guests and um, and autistic voices coming on that to talk about their own experience and to talk about their views and their hopes for the future, um, which is really interesting. Lots of different subjects discussed and it gives us the opportunity to kind of um, talk to talk to all sorts of different people in more fields than just IT. OK, I'm going to pass uh, back to Russ now to talk about what what to look for when looking for an autism friendly employer. Thanks, Ray. Um, so uh, when Sarah and I were looking at this, we, we actually thought we could probably split this, this question into two parts. So what I'm going to do first is just look at kind of what um, what to look for in a job and what, what you should be looking for to give you an indication uh, that an employer is likely to be new inclusive. And then secondly, we're going to look at look if, you, if you're in a job or you're looking to kind of look in a job work in the work environment, what are the examples of adjustments that you, you can request uh, to make uh, the, the workplace more, more accessible. So if Mo, if you want to go on to the next slide. Yeah, sorry, it's not going forward. Excuse it lagging a bit, there we go. <laughs> Great. So in, in terms of kind of what to look for in an individual um, friendly employer, the first thing is something called an uh, equality statement, so or an equity statement. So what, what that means is, uh, if it's um, familiar to some, is um, a, a statement on a company's website or in a job specification that describes their approach to ensuring that their employees are treated fairly and, and equitably. So, so in terms of the, the actual way you would find it, it would probably it usually is maybe embedded in a diversity and equality statement. But we know that there's a difference between equality and equity. So equality being that every individual uh, or group is treated uh, or given the same opportunities and resources. But we know that equity recognises that every, every individual may need different uh, allocation of resources or opportunities to reach the unequal outcome. So we want to make sure that the equity is also included in the diversity inclusion section of an employer's website or job spec. So that, that's something to kind of look for to begin with. Um, looking at also how accessible a website is, we talked about how conscious or aware of an organisation 
organization is about kind of accessibility for neurodivergent employees so in terms of the accessibility of language readability is the website quite text heavy is there lots of information to, and text to scroll through um does the, the, the job spec for example t contain lots of acronyms or jargon without clarity on what that the terms mean and um, is there a lot of ambiguity in terms of the terms that were referred to in, in job specs like good communication skills without a kind of a def definition of what that actually means um, and does is a long list of essential and desirable characteristics without uh, an idea of how many characteristics that that company are expecting someone to to meet um, so these are all some good examples to, to look for in terms of accessibility um, in terms of promotion of neurodiversity, how do that organisation, how do they promote and talk about neurodiversity? So do they share the, ex the lived experiences of their current neuro neurodivergent employees on their website? Uh, how do they promote neuro neurodiversity or, or disability networks again on their website? And what does their impact report say about neurodiversity and how they, how they um, review and, and kind of cater for neurodivergent employees that they, they currently work with? Uh, another really, really useful kind of idea or way of gauging kind of how neuro inclusive an employer is, is whether they are part of or, or um, kind of aligned to the neurodiverse, uh, the disability confidence scheme. So there's a uh, government uh, led scheme which encourages organisations to um, lead, lead the way really in changing attitudes, behaviours towards uh, disability uh, and encouraging neuro uh, inclusive practice. Um, so there are three stages. So Autocom, we are a, dis a disability confident leader. Um, and whilst it may not tell you everything that uh, an, an organisation does to support employees or individuals, uh, it'll give you a good idea about kind of how seriously they take neuro inclusion. Uh, and it's also important to know that, that every company will need to review or renew their um, their status every two to three years. So it really does tell you something about the how important they, that company feels about neuro inclusion. Um, and in terms of the benefits at work, kind of looking aside from kind of things like kind of holiday holiday leave, but what what are things like sick leave entitlement? Um, how does that that employer treat mental health and physical health? Do they do they see them in this in the same way? So it's like parity of esteem. So obviously it's 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 historically been easier to for employees to kind of talk about their physical health, but mental health is, is seen to be kind of more more challenging at work and seen in the responded differently by employers. But how openly do does an employer treat kind of mental health um kind of periods um off work? Um does do the um do the does the employer include uh, access to packages that support well being, so mental health uh um apps or private health insurance? and how flexible the work arrangements as well so is there a is there a kind of expectation of a hybrid model or is there a requirement to work for from an office or is there a bit of flexibility there and 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 lastly uh, in terms of neuro inclusive language um how does the the employer use language on their website it, it, you know what does because we know that language and how it's framed has, has wider implications for attitudes towards neurodivergent conditions and disability generally what does language say about that organization are they are they using outdated terms and perspectives and how inclusive is language um, used by the people that, that you may speak to in the recruitment process potentially and how does that what does that say about their, their attitudes towards uh, neurodivergent con conditions so there's a really kind of short snapshot there of just some really interesting important things to kind of think about uh, when when looking for a neuro inclusive um, employer so I'm going to hand over to Sarah now to share her own experiences. Uh, yeah so um, yeah what does it look like in practice when you're looking for a neurodivergent friendly employer so we asked uh, some of our other Autocon consultants about their experiences and Harry looks for how they communicate about autism is it a difference or a deficit how they demonstrate knowledge or admit they do not know information and then Malcolm adds that he looks for the symbol the symbols and language that they use. Some organisations language and symbols are broadly despised by the autistic community despite being prevalent or even promoted in the autism community. So next slide. Um, so um, when I was searching for jobs uh, the main aspects that I looked for in addition to those that um, have been mentioned um, are a clear recruitment process that's advertised at the application stage which details every stage of the process from from the application all the way through to a job offer and I also look for uh, the option to request any reasonable adjustments at the stage of application 
and what do they use inclusive language both on their job specification and on their public media presence and also I look for information they have on their careers pages about the work environment and if they advertise peer support groups and inclusivity in general. So I wanted to find a job that allows me to be me where I feel comfortable to go to work every day and will be around people who don't judge me. So when starting the job search, it's important to know what you want to get from an employer and not just focus on what an employer can benefit from you. With Auticon, I knew from their social, social message that I would be accepted without needing to mask daily, but they also had a very clear recruitment process listed online, which focused on my skills rather than interviews. And the application was really simple. I just needed to send in my CV and I didn't need to fill out a long form or write a personal statement where I, like, I had to hit keywords just to be considered for the job. So it's it was also fantastic that with Auticon, I had a single person to communicate with throughout the recruitment process who could answer any questions I have, whereas other jobs I applied to, I, I had no one to contact. So these are all quite important signs of how a company will treat you once you start working for them. So they're really important to look for in the first place. Pass back to Russ. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I just want to take you through some examples of what reasonable adjustments might look like at work. And because I think sometimes some people may not realise that that they can actually ask for these um, um, adjustments from employers or, or may not or maybe they're already requesting them, but may not necessarily see them as a, a reasonable adjustment per se. So these these are not exhaustive. Um, this is mainly a combination of adjustments that how we found universally supportive for our consultants. So uh, as the job coaches, these are the, some of the areas that we would we would kind of look at kind of recommending to our clients, but also what some of our consultants have found found useful. So as you, the first thing you'll see is that they're not all practical or equipment based. Some are, but a lot um, are adjustments to uh, or changes to communication, kind of environmental aspects or specific work context. So we do have kind of equipment there. So so that's you know use of headphones, multiple monitors, dictation software, grammar grammar software, Grammarly for example, light filtering software, um, but also having something called a preferred desk. If anyone's uh, kind of familiar with that is having a, a, a familiar desk at a particular work environment if, if that if you do need to go into an office that when you're there that is your designated desk and obviously when you're not working other people can work from it but that's where we are. a lot of our consultants have found that's quite uh, good at reducing kind of uncertainty and increasing kind of familiarity of where that person's going to work from but also kind of any kind of potential kind of anxiety if someone's sitting in a in a particular preferred preferred desk um an example is is kind of the executive functioning side of uh, a strategy so breaking down larger tasks into smaller constituent chunks so we know know that the kind of can lead to more kind of achievable outcomes if if tasks are broken down into kind of a daily or weekly kind of basis so often for a neurodivergent employee that's that's kind of that managing or planning or kind of accomplishing task over a, say a month may be more more difficult but if if we can if you can ask a a a client or or, or a, um, an employer to kind of break down those tasks that that would be uh, that's that's an adjustment you can you can actually recommend at uh, same in a similar way for processing time as as well so a lot of the time um, if if you're asked to uh, respond immediately to a particular task or a question asking for a little bit of bit more time to process the ta the question you've been asked is more than more than a kind of reasonable adjustment to up to ask for kind of responding later in the day or setting up a meeting later in the day, for example. Um, and also communication. So it's obviously very important and perhaps a universally accessible accommodation for a lot of organizations is to encourage use of agendas so in meetings to know kind of what you're expected to, to bring to the to the meeting, what the structure will look like, who will be involved. Um, and that that's something that a lot of a lot of employers should be should be kind of um, using as, as commonplace anyway. But that's something you can can recommend as something that you find universally kind of quite quite helpful. Um, in the similar way, kind of looking at your own um, learning style. So, kind of, do you, how do you like to process information? So, are you more visual? Uh, do you like graphs, images, flowcharts? Do you prefer kind of written or reading information? So, with presentations or documents or auditorily, so so verbal information or even uh, kinesthetic, so being shown how to do a task. So if you know kind of how you like to process information or how best you process information using though that particular um, area or particularly a combination of areas, you can kind of tell um, a, an employer that 
this is your preference for how you like information to be shown or tasks to be kind of um, demonstrated. Um, in terms of kind of working pattern, um, having a kind of an idea of uh, your adjusted hours, so what hours your core hours are, but I, an idea of kind of you like them to be adjusted slightly later or slightly earlier, depending on if you have any um, areas of a kind of executive functioning where you may prefer to kind of start slightly later, or if you require kind of to avoid kind of uh, commuting, for example, in the early hours, and you might need a kind of a slightly later start. That's something you can request in a similar way, kind of having a hybrid model of working. So, kind of working from the office a couple of days a week and from home and other days is also kind of a reasonable adjustment that 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 you you can recommend. Yes. Yeah, so, some of my personal reasonable adjustments that I use to help regulate my senses include using noise cancelling headphones and or using loop earplugs which help with external noises and controlling the sounds that I hear and I also often wear a cap to block out like direct overhead lighting um, if the office environment doesn't have the possibility for dimmable lighting or filters. Um, I also like to have a blanket in the office because that provides both like a weight and a texture to like help calm me um, I also use blue light glasses or screen filters that help reduce the eye strain and fatigue when working on a computer all day. And in my home setup, I use a desk light which is dimmable and can help and can change colours as well. Um, and I also have a lava lamp on my desk for when I need some like extra visual stimulation. It just creates uh, a calming environment whilst I work. And from a more practical workplace adjustment perspective. Um, I um, enjoy use having a hybrid working um, system to prevent overload because I enjoy going into the office once or twice a week because it adds structure to my day and a social aspect. But being able to work from home um, a lot helps me manage my energy levels better without adding um, on additional stress from the commute or just long working hours. Um, so another one I have is having open discussions with about how I and other team members communicate um, and I found this really useful for reducing the stress that comes from miscommunication and it creates an environment where everyone feels comfortable to say if they don't understand something um, and it could and ask for things to be explained in a different way because I've had some issues with this in the past um, where people have thought that they've been communicating well like if you just have very different communication styles mm -hmm. um, and without having that, I don't understand, everyone seems to get a bit stressed and doesn't understand things. But now we know to immediately just say, I don't understand it, let's try a different way. Um, and then I also uh, use a day per page planner to manage my schedule that has a schedule of the day with the times, but also then like a to-do list uh, to help with my executive functioning and to help me like manage my time better and keep me focused on the tasks that I need to complete that day. Yeah, so we're now going to go on to um, how to manage the recruitment process. And I think we've got a video from Malcolm to start this. Yeah, just a little kind of volume warning here for anybody wearing headphones. Um, I will turn the volume down at the beginning and slowly increase it, but you might need to adjust um, your own kind of uh, volume on your own head headset. So just be aware of that. Hello, I'm Malcolm. I'm a consultant at Autocom in the UK. I've worked here for just over three months since the end of 2022. I got an informal autism diagnosis when I was about 14 years old and I got a formal autism diagnosis when I was 30. I studied physics at university and I graduated with a Master of Physics degree just over 10 years ago. I've had quite a range of employment in the past, so that includes retail, cleaning, digitising records, finance, nuclear safety using computers, radiotherapy in a hospital and IT in clinical systems in a hospital as well. And obviously at the moment I work for Autocon as a consultant. I've been asked to talk about disclosure in the workplace and I'll be reading from notes to try to make sure I include the important things. 
So on the topic of reactions I've had to my autism diagnosis where I've disclosed it in the workplace, uh, I found most managers understanding, managers and colleagues, in fact, most of them, their understanding of autism was limited or almost non-existent. Uh, some managers went on courses to learn about autism and also spoke with me specifically to understand me, but some others made or seemed to make no effort at all. I've noticed that disclosing to colleagues and possibly even to some managers can pose a risk of being bullied or harassed or scapegoated if things do go wrong in the workplace. Um, and I realised the law should defend autistic people from discrimination, but I've also found that a lot of the duty, in my experience, is on the autistic person to inform their employers about autism and also to defend their own rights often. Um, so I've also seen many employers do welcome innovation and new perspectives, and they claim to embrace or champion diversity, but some of those same employers seem to do little to actually cater for any differences in their staff or to support marginalised people. In terms of employers and reasonable adjustments I've had, in different jobs I've been either undiagnosed or I've not declared it to the employer, or I've declared it during employment, or I've declared it before I've even signed the employment contract. And one employer said I could have reasonable adjustments if my diagnosis was disclosed to the entire department, which was 150 people. Uh, some employers have allowed me some sensory adjustments, such as wearing earplugs or a desk position that has fewer distractions. Two employers offered me support from colleagues, but this was in our own time and not actively supported by my employer. And one employer consistently failed to provide a very basic reasonable adjustment of having regular meetings with my line manager. And that was despite them being aware of that reasonable adjustment before I even signed the contract to join their organisation. In terms of how I've coped with bad experiences and reactions in the workplace, I've made sure I've formed a safety net in terms of supportive friends or family and also try to maintain financial security and geographical mobility in case I do need to move to a different job potentially. It often also requires simply a lot of perseverance and effort to overcome bad experiences. Sometimes my response to a bad situation in a workplace is to look for another job, but that does require a level of privilege and mobility and obviously also a lot of effort. And if you do move geographically in that process, it impacts your social circle. It could sacrifice a progression with a particular employer or even in that particular specialism or a direction you had got in mind. Um, and less desperate for a job than disclosing to an employer early, I think is a good idea and possibly before you even apply to the job. That way you can gauge that response and if the response is unsuitable for you, then you simply don't apply or you decide to leave when you can. What I've learned from my experiences in the workplace, um, an autistic person would be less protected from discrimination and less able or empowered to disclose being autistic even if their financial situation, social network or support from social or medical services are bad. The situation for people in university and going into work now is probably much better than it was for me more than 10 years ago, but I still don't think it's ideal. Right, pass you back to Sarah now to talk more about the recruitment process. Sarah, just turn your Ooh. mic on. Thanks, I uh, forgot that I'd muted myself during that. <laughs> um, yeah, so the recruitment process can be quite daunting, especially if the company hasn't provided clear information on what the process involves. 
So it's important to understand what reasonable adjustments will help you with certain stages and to make sure you advocate for them. In an ideal world, all companies would ask everyone if, they are, if there are any reasonable adjustments they require, but this isn't always the case. If you ask for reasonable adjustments and they refuse them, then maybe the company isn't right for you. If they won't provide re adjustments in the recruitment phase, then they are unlikely to provide them in the workplace. So most companies should be open to reasonable adjustments, but they might not always know what adjustments to offer you. So be prepared to ask for what you need rather than expecting them to um, uh, know what adjustments to give you. So one recruitment process I went through uh, prior to starting at Autocon involved a 30 minute task followed by a 30 minute interview. So during my in during my application process, I informed them that I required reasonable adjustments and they offered me 25% uh, extra time for the task, which gave me 37 minutes in total for that task. I also told them about my auditory processing differences, which affects my ability to recall certain words and information occasionally. And this was mostly just to reduce my stress levels during the interview, um, but I didn't think to ask for any other adjustments. Uh, this was uh, in 2021, so it was a completely remote process. Um, I was informed of what the, what would be involved in the task and the software that I would require uh, via an email um, about a week before the interview day. Um, but I wasn't given the exact details of what the task involved until it started. So waiting for the task email to arrive was quite anxiety inducing and I was also expecting a call from a team member a few minutes um, into the task starting to check if everything OK and if I had any questions. And it was great to have this call in case there were any questions, but also I find calls quite anxiety inducing. So it, it, it was kind of a difficult one to have an adjustment for. Um, but yeah, when the task arrived, um, I found out that it included a really large complex spreadsheet with uh, lots of long drop down lists that you had to select the correct category from. And then an email containing details that needed to be transferred to that spreadsheet. I'm a really detail orientated person, so it took me at, like at least 15 minutes of my 37 minutes just to understand the spreadsheet as there was so much to process and try to figure out what was going on in it. And there was also then quite a lot of information to transfer from the information I was given. At the beginning, I was informed that they didn't expect uh, me to finish the task. Uh, they just wanted you to complete as much as possible, but it's quite difficult to submit an incomplete task. So from this experience, I learned that I would have really benefited from being able to see the spreadsheet a few days before the task so that I could become familiar with it. Without the details from the email um, that needed to be transferred to the spreadsheet, I wouldn't have been able to complete the task ahead of time, um, but I would have at least been able to look through it and feel comfortable with what it contained and what the different options were. So I would have felt prepared when, it, when the task started. This would have like greatly reduced my anxiety on the day and it would have actually allowed me to perform to my true potential like I would have if I was actually in the in that role performing that job on a day to day basis. So another example I have, uh, which is closer to an interview process, was when I was sitting my Viva for my PhD. So during this, I requested that I was provided with some of the in, with some of the questions in advance to allow me to prepare for specific details they may want um, in case I wasn't able to recall the exact details on the spot on the day. And having this was fantastic. It greatly reduced my anxiety and it really allowed me to present my work to the best of my abilities. Whereas if I hadn't have been given this, I know that I would have uh, been panicking and there'd be bits of information I wasn't quite sure on and it would have been a really scary process whereas I actually came out of my Viva having had a great time because I was I had everything I needed to actually just have a great discussion about my work. So what I took away from these experiences is that um, I want to ask to see any tools and like interview questions ahead of time so that I can get familiar with the content and then I can perform to my best and they can actually see who they're going to get if I were to get the position. And other like reasonable adjustments that can be useful asking for depending on the situation are really 
advocating for your preferred communication options, whether that's email, phone or video calls, um, and then asking for information about what to expect on the day, like how to travel there, how to find the room, the agenda, uh, who you'll be meeting and just what to expect in general. And when you're wanting accommodations, it's best for, to ask for these as soon as you are able to because this allows adequate time for them to get the information to you, but it also gives you as much time to prepare in advance so you're as comfortable as you are, uh, you're as comfortable as you can be going into the day. And I'll just pass on to Russ to cover a few other aspects. Sorry, it's from Maggie again. Okay. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, just to follow on what, from what Sarah was just saying, really, actually, the, my first advice would be just, just know that you can ask for questions in advance or, or or think about kind of asking for typical questions to expect from the interview process and, and it can help to clarify um in advance what what um or give, give the employer an idea of why it is that you you would find that 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 particular kind of um, request helpful so as 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 um so alluded to to increase familiarity manage uncertainty to know what to expect and, it, and again, as, as Sarah mentioned, it, it will give you an idea uh, in terms of the employer's response, uh, an indication of how aware they are of, of managing uh, neurodiversity at, at work. Um, another another kind of piece of advice would, it would be to perhaps avoid any kind of negative or self-critical language. And so if, if particularly in an interview context, um, it can be easy if, if asked a question that, that you're not familiar with or you don't have much experience with to respond quite honestly. Um, so maybe mean, in, instead of saying that you're you aren't unsure on that area, it's it's to kind of bound saying that you don't have as much experience, but that your interests lie in other areas. Or if you're kind of not familiar with a specific task or area or program, um, that you'd be interested to learn more in this area. Um, so kind of whilst it is, is being kind of honest about any gaps in knowledge, you're also letting the employer know kind of where you're being in, willing to kind of increase knowledge or expand knowledge um, where, where, where you have that interest. Um, another another kind of area to be aware of is it's OK for questions to be repeated. It's it's very easy to feel like you need to be the present as the kind of a perfect type of employee. But I, I feel it's really important that if you aren't sure about questions that's been asked, it's, if it needs to be rephrased, if you didn't quite hear all of the question or, or you actually prefer questions to be repeated due to, due to processing, please feel comfortable, com confident, comfortable saying, can you please repeat the question? Um, often, I think sometimes interviewers don't really realise that they may be asking two questions at the same time. So often things like, uh, can you tell us about a difficult situation you faced at work and how you managed it are actually two questions. Um, so you can, can actually say that by saying, um, you, you know, I appreciate you've asked two questions there. I'll ask the first part of your question first and then I'll move on to kind of how I managed the, the situation there. So you can really clarify kind of what the expectations are uh, and to be really clear of what, what, what you're kind of what you're, you're kind of answering. Um, pretty kind of seems self-explanatory, but really, really good to kind of do research on the company beforehand to kind of embed that into some answers that you prepared. Um, again, mainly the, the basics would be kind of who, when the company was founded, current leadership team, um, kind of any updates, I think are quite useful from kind of a website, kind of updates from a CEO or kind of the company leadership around the current company's current directions or even values can be really good to make a point of that um, and it will, all, already always really good to kind of know the names remember the names of who will be interviewing you and and kind of interact and present as a you you kind of know who they are and that will demonstrate that you've kind of done some research in in, in the kind of what to expect in, in terms of the interview itself prepare for frequently asked questions i think is always a really good good thing to do there may be specific questions particular to the role of industry they're in but i think there are kind of a few questions to to know to expect in some way or another so something like uh, why have you applied for the role so looking at your motivation so have a think about kind of what your what 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 gives you pleasure purpose enjoyment and challenge in, in the role um kind of uh, what interests you in the role? So similarly to your kind of what what it does interest you. So it's maybe a little bit subjective, but what what they really would want to hear is kind of the sense of enjoyment or passion or motivation that you would have in in doing that that particular job. Um, and then lastly, kind of what skills you think you would bring to the role. 
So both technical and personal could have strengths. So if you write down what or ask some friends and family or your colleagues or people at university or work, where what what are your strengths? Well, what what, what technical skills do you do you bring to a role? Where what would what would other people say about you? And can, that can help give you an idea of, of kind of what you would bring to that 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 that, that question. And as, as Sarah mentioned earlier, remember the interview is not just about kind of the employer assessing the your ability to, do the, to the to the role. It's also about assessing fit and how you feel that they would manage and support support you and whether you feel it's a good good fit for you. So always have some questions in and uh, to to ask at the end of a uh, of an interview. So something like, um, what would a usual working day look like in this role, or what are the main goals or targets for for my role? In the next six months or year, uh, or what opportunities do you do this? Does this role have for upskilling and training? And so that's really some really good kind of examples. But but you can you perhaps think of more specific ones for your for that particular role. And and lastly, um, doing a trial run and an interview, a mock interview with family, friends, uh, colleagues beforehand is is a really good uh, way to kind of see how you would respond to different questions, um, go through your responses with uh, with your with your friends and family, uh, and, and obviously think about how you would feel about those questions coming up and how would you respond differently. Uh, and also physically doing a trial run of the commute to the, the interview uh, location, or even pretending to do, it, as I say, a mock interview and how you'd set it up, kind of having your script ready or any any, any notes that you would like ready with you. Um, and, and don't always, don't, don't feel kind of concerned or worried about bringing in some notes something to take notes into an interview as well because that actually shows that you're processing uh the questions that are being asked so don't, don't worry about thinking that you need to respond immediately to a question that's asked so that that can often help as as, as well so when it comes to disclosure um and whether you should or shouldn't disclose. Um, I've personally always cho chosen to disclose to my employer, either during the recruitment phase or in the initial stages of working together. I found that their response to my disclosure to be a key indicator in how the working relationship would progress and what I'd be comfortable talking to them about in the future. Um, so you should never need to disclose to anyone, but the advantages for me are that it reduces my need to mask which gives me more energy to focus on my work and prevent burnout and meltdown. Um, it reduces the misunderstanding between parties. By disclosing, you're displaying a level of trust, which hopefully they will reciprocate. This opens up the lines of communication to discuss what you, you might be struggling with and adjustments that can be put in place to help. It also allows you to communicate when you don't understand something, so uncertainties can be cleared up before they become overwhelming. And uh, by disclosing, you might also learn about support options that you weren't aware of before, such as quiet rooms you can go when you just need a break, or support groups that are out there that you might want to participate in. So from my experience, without disclosing, it's quite difficult to maintain long-term employment and good mental health. Um, and this may result in extended period of burnout, which prevents you from being able to work. So this happened to me with jobs I had prior to diagnosis because I only got diagnosed at 25 uh, in like in the beginning, like during my PhD. So Autocon is the only job I've had since then. Uh, but prior to Autocon and prior to diagnosis, I, I had some experience in the workplace. So I found that when I was masking all day, um, it left me with no energy left to do anything. And ultimately, I had several months of burnout after I left, where even the simplest of tasks took momentous energy. So um, if, you, if you're a person who happens to be super in tune with your bodies and what it needs and how to look after your mental health, then you might be able to survive the workplace without disclosing. But currently, most workplaces don't provide the necessary adjustments without the disclosure, and they can just have that extra impact on your body if you haven't disclosed um, that you just aren't prepared to do, like there just aren't the facilities there to deal with. Um, so from my experience, um, you're much better, better at advocating for yourself when you're in a good place mentally, rather than waiting until you reach breaking point, uh, which you have to disclose. When I'm in a, a state of burnout or meltdown, I find it really hard to communicate what I need. Whereas if I'm in a really good place mentally, I can tell them this this can happen. If these certain stresses, this can happen. 
please, I need this to deal with it. Whereas in the moment, I wouldn't be able to say that. So um, yeah, I'll just pass over now to talk a bit more about disclosure. Ross, you're on mute. Thank you. I tend to forget. All right, so so as I was, I was just about to say, so Malcolm and and Sarah both highlighted that disclosure is is a really uniquely personal choice. So everyone has 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 the, the kind of the, the different reasons and and circumstances around choosing to disclose or not disclose. So I, I I won't want don't want to persuade or dissuade anyone one way or another. Um, but perhaps I think offer up a discussion topics here that I feel will kind of help you make the right decision that's right for you um so firstly it's your choice it's always your choice it's your your personal information as sarah malcolm has alluded to the decisions around the information you choose to share are uniquely yours and that is perhaps the most important thing to think about you can disclose at any point um and when you you choose to disclose it can be whatever information you choose to disclose so whether it's your diagnosis uh, any adjustments what helps you um kind of how you want to disclose is up is up totally up to you as well in an email uh, in person online uh, who to is also up to you um you can tell and tell you know as, as i guess malcolm was saying he was given the option to, to disclose to to kind of either one person or all of the 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 kind of organization which which for him felt uncomfortable and you that's something you need to make a decision on and about if that's if makes you feel uncomfortable then that's a decision not to disclose if you as sarah was saying if it makes you feel more comfortable and more able to kind of be yourself uh, to uh, for others to know then disclosing at the right time is something to consider um and, and kind of making sure that you can reduce burnout potentially having reasonable adjustments that everyone is aware of um but as as malcolm has said uh, sometimes it feels like in employment uh, the individual is forced to disclose before anything is put in place and if you feel that you're in that position then on balance perhaps perhaps it's around having a discussion about whether that's the right decision for you um uh, but but what ultimately we do know is that you have more rights uh if you disclose but also your employer has more responsibility so if you do disclose uh, undoubtedly it is a daunting process it, it puts you in a vulnerable position potentially of not knowing how a, uh, an employer will respond um well I've just in the slides gone a bit bit other oh, fine <laughs> um um but ultimately uh the law is on your side so if you choose to disclose the 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 equality act says that your your employer the employer has a legal right to provide reasonable adjustments actually they actually have a legal right even if they they think that you would would meet the equality act for um protected characteristics or disability so if you even if they 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 presume that you would require reasonable adjustments they actually have to do something to in, in recommend reasonable adjustments but if you if you disclose formally then that makes it quite crystal clear and unambiguous that the actual employer has a duty of care to provide assistance and support through reasonable adjustments. Um, uh, another element is to, to talk about your strengths and disclose strengths as well. I mean, often the narrative around reasonable adjustments to disclosure is, is, is it misses the point that such conversations should be uh, ensuring equity as we talked about earlier so so th that you're able to showcase your strengths in the role so when talking about reasonable adjustments it's all it's as much worth kind of looking in and embedding how an adjustment will be beneficial for the impact on your work because uh, that's ultimately what an employer will kind of want want to know for an employee so as, as Sarah is alluding to the kind of the disclosure enabled her to to kind of reduce masking uh, and that's something that enables kind of how to reduce anxiety and, st and stress so I think if in terms of the employer knowing the impact that a reasonable adjustment will have in terms of how that will kind of impact positively in in, in your work will be beneficial um talking to those you trust uh, is really important about whether whether you should disclose or not sense check seek advice seek support um for those really those people who use values and opinions you trust because uh, that will be able to reassure you that kind of how you're feeling and help you navigate kind of weighs up the, the pros and cons that are right for you and your situation and your experience because as I said it's person it's very personal um about what what you choose to do and, and kind of what decision is right for you to help you make that kind of important choice um and thinking that the thing uh, think it's always really useful to kind of use um support networks that are out there so university careers advice often really invaluable a um, source of support and guidance uh, as well as NAS um, 
are really, that's really important. Um, and also, also kind of things like um, even work, uh, even break and patchwork club are really good at kind of accessing support for individuals that, that are thinking of just disclosing. Um, so it's it's really important, as I say, just to, to make the decision that's that's right for you to really to really understand kind of what adjustments you need. Whether it's um, the employer, as we've talked about, just to bring everything together, is is demonstrating that they have an awareness and understanding of, of neuro inclusion, and they you feel that they would be receptive to 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 kind of reasonable adjustments. If you're if you're not sure, always talk to to someone that you whose value or opinion uh, opinion you trust and value, um, and, and and speak to the kind of um, to um, university support networks. So I think we're going to finish now with um, a video from Emma as well. Emma. I have been with Orthicon for just over six months now. I started in July 2022. Um, before that I worked in the law sector um, and I had a few short-term jobs um, after my after graduating. I graduated in 2020, 2020 um, graduated from Cambridge with a degree in physics. Um, and I actually, so I wasn't diagnosed until just after my graduation. I was diagnosed um, late 2020. Um, I had kind of known that I wasn't, something was a bit weird for my whole life, but never had any labels. Um, and then while I was at university, I had a lot of mental health problems and that led to a lot of um, kind of looking for diagnoses, looking for answers, um, and kind of understanding, getting an autism diagnosis, understanding that part of myself was um, part of kind of the mental health treatment process for me. Um, so I never had any, you know, going through school and university, I had never had any adjustments, um, never, never had any diagnoses, and kind of getting the autism diagnosis for me, I think, was a really positive thing. And so I felt really, um, I didn't have any issues when it came to disclosure or wanting to hide, wanting to not disclose that I was autistic. Um, when I was looking for jobs, I, I kind of disclosed at the earliest point that I could a lot of companies have a kind of box that you can fill in on kind of an initial you know your first the first thing you send to them is some kind of form that you fill in and there's often a box there um, and I definitely made a point of trying to made a point of mentioning that I was autistic if I was having any interviews um, particularly if they were interviews video interviews or phone interviews um, sorry in-person interviews um, I found that this seemed to improve my chances of getting to the next stage of recruitment. It felt like a lot of, uh, with face-to-face -face or video interviews, it was a lot more obvious that I was missing social cues or I wasn't making as much eye contact as expected. And so disclosing that I was autistic meant that people knew what that was. Um, and I felt I got a much more fair consideration as a result. So, and I, I, I I also felt that even though there was a risk that some companies might see that I was autistic and decide not to progress my application, that those were companies that I had no interest in working for. And so for me, kind of early disclosure was also about ruling out companies that, that wouldn't be supportive. Um, and so when I started my first job, I'd kind of I mentioned during the recruitment process that I was autistic. Um, and then kind of just before I actually started, I got in touch with them and uh, asked if you asked to talk about kind of reasonable adjustments, things that I might need um, to help me. And I I kind of did this, I did a lot of research. Um, there's kind of the National Autistic Society has a bit of information about kind of requesting adjustments and supporting autistic employees in the workplace. Um, and I kind of went through examples that they suggested. 
um, trying to think of anything that I thought would be helpful. I had that, but I, I found that it was really, it was really, I felt like I was being really difficult when I was asking for adjustments. Um, I felt, I was really worried that I was asking too much. Um, you know, I didn't really know what would count, what would count as reasonable. Um, and a lot of the time, things that I asked for, even if I felt if I felt they were completely reasonable, um, just didn't get actioned. Um, for example, I, I have a lot of um, light sensitivity and I get migraines. And so fluorescent lighting, like really bright lighting can be a problem for me. Um, and so I wanted to turn off or, or dim or do something about the lighting near my desk. Um, and that proved to be really difficult. There were all of these hurdles around kind of getting getting that done. And, and there was just no, I felt like I was constantly having to push and remind people. Um, and, and in the end, uh, after, you know, when I left after um, almost a year, that still hadn't been resolved. Um, I made the decision to leave. Um, because I felt like there were, there were difficulties around communication. Um, I was really struggling switching between managers all the time um, when doing lots of work for different people, everyone having different working styles, different communication styles, wanting different levels of updates and involvement in the work I was doing for them. Um, I just felt kind of confused and overwhelmed so much of the time. Um, I, I felt like the, you know, that the, the uh, company I worked for, they were, they wanted kind of all of the, all of the bits of me being on the spectrum that made me good at my job, my, you know, attention to detail, um, and none of the things that, that were more challenging, um, and they were very, there was a lot of reluctance to adjust the ways that they worked or communicated. Um, so I I decided that I, I that it just wasn't it wasn't going to work for me, that it was kind of affecting my mental health, it just wasn't good for my well-being um, to be in an environment that wasn't supportive. Um, I, I just wasn't enjoying my job very much. So I looked, decided to look for something else. Um. Emma actually went on to carry on talking about um, her experience and um, we've, we've made that into a second film actually as what she found has helped her. So we'll make that available to you all um, to listen to afterwards if you, if you want, if you're interested to find out more about her story. 